Hi everyone, welcome to our 10th FreeBSD Friday. I'm Deb Goodkin, the Executive Director of the FreeBSD Foundation. First, I'd like to thank all of you who are watching this either live right now or um, maybe the recording. So I wanted to let you know that you could go to our website and see all the upcoming talks and also access all the recordings there. And we'll go ahead and post the link to that in the IRC channel. Now, if you have a question during the talk today, you can post it in the IRC channel and uh, proceed the question with a queue so we know it's a question. So today our presentation is an introduction to Beehive by Peter Green. Um, so here's a little bit about Peter. Uh, he's, uh, he's been a FreeBSD committer since 2002 and co-author of FreeBSD's Native Beehive Hyper Hypervisor. In the past, he's worked on BSD at DAC, Nokia, and NetApp. Peter lives in Australia and enjoys spending time at the beach when not in front of a computer screen. So that's a big reason why we're running this at a different time. So now I'd like to hand this off to Peter. Thanks, Deb. And thanks to the FreeBSD Foundation for um, setting up this talk. Uh, let me just get the presentation happening here. Um, so today I'm just going to give a fairly short introduction to Beehive. Um, this is mainly for people that uh, um, aren't already using it and want to know what's it about. It may want to know somewhat about um, how it actually fits together and works. Um, as Deb mentioned, I'm quite happy to take questions um, during the talk. So if you have a question, just bring it up on IRC and it'll get relayed to me and I'll try to uh, get to it probably at the end of each slide. So firstly, what is Beehive? Uh, it's just a sort of acronym that is short for BSD Hypervisor. Um, it's included in the base system in FreeBSD, but uh, currently only on FreeBSD AMD64. Um, it utilizes a hardware acceleration provided by Intel, their name for that is VTX, and it also works on AMD and it uses uh, SVM, which is AMD's equivalent to VTX. Um, what it offers is it allows you to run virtual machines at uh, almost native speed. So this is quite different than, say, a pure software emulator like Box or QMU, which uh, just do Intel instructions in software. And they get, you know, somewhere like a 100x slowdown. So when you're using um, hardware features, you can actually run a complete machine at uh, almost the speed of the CPU itself. Uh, so what I'm going to cover in this talk is um, where did Beehive come from? Uh, what are the actual pieces in Beehive? Um, how we virtualize CPU, memory, and I.O. Um, how you can monitor it on a system. And just some references uh, to kind of go further on from this talk. So where did Beehive actually came from, come from? So it was developed um, at NetApp. There was an internal project. This started um, sort of late 2010. Uh, Intel VTX actually was released in uh, like about 2006, but the first version of VTX uh, really didn't give you much assistance. So it took a quite a large amount of code to get that going. Um, however, in uh, 2009, Intel released the Nahalem CPU, and they added a feature called EPT, uh, which stands for Extended Page Tables. And that was basically um, giving full hardware assist to the hardest part of writing a hypervisor. So instead of maybe a team of 20 pe 10 or 20 people, 30,000 lines of code, uh, all of a sudden it was possible to write a hypervisor with just a very small number of people and not a huge amount of code. 
Um, so the timing was kind of fortuitous because there wasn't a lot of people working on this at NetApp. Um, but with Nihalem being released, all of a sudden, um, what had previously been shut off was now going to be accessible. Uh, unfortunately, that project um, at NetApp never really made it. Um, however, the company decided that rather than keep this effort internal, uh, they would give it to FreeBSD in the hope that um, maybe it be, could, could become something useful in the open source world. Uh, so that donation was made in May 2011. Uh, development continued in FreeBSD, but it may be a great pace. Um, but uh, it's kept moving forward since then. Uh, maybe some big milestones were when SVM support for AMD was added. That was in October 2014. And uh, maybe the most important one was when we could actually run Windows as a guest. And that arrived in May 2016. Uh, so what are the pieces of Beehive? So there's a couple of uh, executables in user space. Um, there's a shared library. And uh, all of the very detailed work happens in a kernel module. Um, so the kernel module uh, handles the context switch from FreeBSD to a, a guest operating system. Um, it also handles um, memory for the guest. Uh, it uses timers because kernel timers are you know, much higher resolution than what you can get in user space. And it handles some of the kind of low level um, interrupt delivery to a guest. Uh, the user space process uh, has um, the device simulation and also just sort of general setup of the guest. Um, but really, we try to not, not run a whole lot of code there. The, the whole idea of Beehive is to keep the guest running as much as it possibly can. Um, so Beehive really just kind of handles uh, exception conditions for the guest. Um, there's also a utility, Beehive Control. Uh, and that's used for uh, debug, kind of dumping state of a guest. And it can also um, tear down resources of a virtual machine. Uh, none of these components are really very big. Um, you're kind of talking about hundreds of K of text. Uh, for Beehive, the kernel module is maybe a little bit smaller than that. Um, so it's really not a, a large piece of software. So I want to go through just um, how the different parts of a guest are virtualized. So maybe the most important one is CPU virtualization. So what we have to do is switch over into a guest uh, with all guest state and just let that CPU just run freely. So the kind of mapping of that to FreeBSD is we represent a virtual machine with a process, just a single process on FreeBSD. And a virtual CPU inside that process is a thread. There's one thread per virtual CPU. So basically what happens is uh, we set up the state of each virtual CPU to power on state. And then the, each thread will then call into the kernel and the kernel will then context switch into the guest and then free run until some condition happens that it has to exit and then it can be handled by Beehive. So basically you have a set of threads that are just sitting there, uh, context switching into the guest and running. And of course, if you wanna have an SMP system, uh, you just have multiple of these threads uh, inside that one process. Um, as I mentioned earlier, one of the more complex parts is memory virtualization. So what you want to do for a guest is when it's running, it, it has no idea that it's uh, not seeing physical memory underneath it. So we want to give the guest the illusion that it has memory, just like what you have on a real system. You know, if you have an eight gig virtual machine, it would should be no different from a guest perspective than if it was running on a, uh, a physical piece of hardware with eight gigabytes. Um, however, it's really hard to carve out eight gig of memory and just give that to a guest. Uh, in an operating system, usually you deal with allocations on a page basis. 
So what both Intel and AMD have done is provide a mechanism called second level page tables, which is a way to map guest physical memory to host physical memory. Uh, and that's very similar to a normal page table, which is used just to map virtual memory of a process to physical memory. Um, but this is one extra level because a guest is already doing virtual memory um, inside its virtual machine where it has its own page tables. But uh, every, every physical page that the guest thinks it has then gets translated through another set of page tables to uh, host physical memory. Uh, so the nice part of this is that you don't need contiguous memory for a guest. It can just be any set of scattered pages. And the other thing is that you're actually allowed to page fold if physical memory isn't present. So rather than having to allocate all the guest memory up front, Similar to how a user process works on Unix, you can just demand fault in um, guest memory. Um, so you don't actually need to use all memory until a guest touches it. Um, so rather than implementing all of that ourselves in the um, VMM loadable module, the mechanism of doing this translation is sort of identical to how the FreeBSD virtual memory system already works for user processes. So with a very small amount of modification to FreeBSD, we were able to reuse uh, the virtual memory system to support the guest physical translation to host physical, uh, which um, reduced a lot of code and also allows us to reuse features of the FreeBSD virtual memory system, such as um, transparent super page promotion. Um, in addition to faulting in um, guest memory, um, because it's backed by swap space, uh, if there's memory pressure on the system, you can actually swap out guest pages and then fault them back in again when they're touched. Uh, however, this is uh, pretty bad for performance because uh, you have to sort of wait for a page to come in off um, swap space. So it's not recommended, but it's um, possible to do this. So by far the largest uh, amount of code in Beehive is to virtualize I.O. Um, now, unfortunately, the virtualization assist that's provided by Intel and AMD CPUs isn't available for I.O. They pretty much lead that as an exercise to the implementer. So um, what then has to be done is the hypervisor has to, uh, in software, implement what looks like uh, a complete PC system. And pretty much most of the code in um, the Beehive uh, user executable is just dedicated to device, to emulation of devices. And what we have to do is give the guests the illusion that they are running on what looks like a stock PC. Um, you know, all the hardware that you would expect on an Intel PC um, is available uh, via Beehive. So everything that you're familiar with, whether it's serial ports, um, PCI bus, adapters that you can plug into slots on a PCI bus, um, timers, um, interrupt support, um, that all has to be implemented in Beehive. So I'm just going to run through each of those categories. Um, so uh, an obvious one is timers. So a PC system has quite a large number of timers and also clock sources. Um, the classic one is the 8254 uh, interval timer. Um, there's also the HPET. Um, the APIC interrupt controller itself also has a timer. Um, there's also a PM timer, which is implemented for ACPI support. Uh, and of course, there's the classic uh, real-time clock um, just to provide uh, time of day support. Uh, one exception of implementing things in user space is that all the timers in Beehive are implemented uh, in the kernel. And the reason that we did that is uh, if you implement timers in user space, uh, because a user space process can be preempted at any time, you can't really control exactly the duration of timers. And often what we were finding was that uh, when we had timers implemented in user space, um, 
particular guests weren't able to boot because they would do timer calibration and uh, they would uh, complain that the resolution of some of these timers just wasn't good enough uh, to even boot the system. So we ended up moving all the timers into the kernel. Um, that took away um, the jitter just because uh, the kernel is a lot less preemptible than user space. Um, but the other advantage is that we're able to use high resolution timers that FreeBSD provides in the kernel. So the accuracy of emulating some of these timers was improved um, a great deal. And that fixed all the problems that we had with booting guests. Uh, so one of the most important parts of emulation is to give a uh, a PCI um, hierarchy to a guest. Um, you know, we basically want to have the ability to have different types of I/O and have it very configurable. What happens in a normal PC is you just have a number of PCI slots that you can put adapters into. Um, so we basically emulated um, uh, that facility. In Beehive, it's a little strange. It's kind of a very weird hybrid of parallel PCI and PCI Express. But it turns out that GETs don't really care about that. The way that they do the scan uh, works fine on both. Um, so basically, we just give what, what could be a very large hierarchy. Through configuration to Beehive, you can place virtual adapters at slots in this hierarchy. Um, we support all the different types of interrupts um, for adapters, uh, including MSI and MSIX for PCI Express. And different than an, in a normal system, you can actually have a massive number of uh, slots available. So you're not limited to what you can fit in the chassis. So in theory, we could actually have 256 times 32 times 8 um, devices attached to a virtual machine, uh, which you can never do on a real system. So uh, one of the features that uses the PCI emulation is network virtualization. So you basically want to have the ability for a guest to communicate with the outside world via the network. So the way that we do that is we provide an emulation of a NIC, and then you can assign uh, the output in, uh, of the NIC to a device on the host, and then that's a way to pass Ethernet frames that uh, coming from the outside all the way into a guest. So Beehive has two, currently has two types of network emulation. Uh, the main one that people are familiar with is called VertIO-Net, uh, which is a para-virtualized interface. Um, in theory, it offers high performance, although not with all guests, um, and is actually fairly widely available. Uh, we also offer an additional emulation, and that's the classic E1000 that um, all hypervisors um, offer as a um, NIC. Uh, and the reason for that is that um, for older operating systems that don't support VertiNet, they generally always support an Intel Gigabit Ethernet adapter. And uh, more importantly, with Windows, it's in the base install, so you don't have to add any extra drivers uh, to get Windows working. Um, unfortunately, it's not as high performance as VertiNet. Um, but um, this is mainly for a kind of ease of use, ease of install. Uh, the MAC address for these, uh, we currently um, can auto-generate them, and it's just based on a hash of the virtual machine name and the slot, slot number that the uh, NIC is associated with. Uh, but you can actually override it and put in your own MAC address, for instance, if you have to move virtual machines from uh, different host physical machines, or you want to maintain um, a MAC address from a, like a network boot setup. Um, currently, the main way to uh, connect virtual machines to the network is to use uh, the FreeBSD tap device. So that looks like a network interface um, when you're on the host, but it's actually a character device that allows frames to be set and received from it. So the virtual machine uses the character device interface um, to do the frame send and receive. And then on the host, you can either just have the tap device connected to the host, but what most people do is use a bridge device, and they'll then connect the tap device to the bridge, and then connect a, uh, 
an external Ethernet interface on the host of the bridge, and then that allows frames to move from the outside world into the virtual machine. Uh, the next type of I.O. that is emulated uh, in Beehive is disk. Um, so we provide a number of different um, forms of disk emulation. Uh, there's kind of the standard AHCI, which is in pretty much every PC since about 2000. And we provide both just hard disk and CD-ROM support for that. Um, a more recent one added is NVMe, and that's uh, much higher performance. Uh, there's also Virto Block, which is actually the first emulation added in Beehive. Um, its performance is okay, maybe not as good as NVMe. And uh, also there's Virto SCSI available, and that's kind of more for um, advanced features if you need to add um, a lot more disks because it looks like a SCSI bus. Uh, you can put as many disks as can fit on the bus onto that. Um, currently, uh, the backing device for a disk emulation can be just a file which contains the contents of the disk um, or like an ISO image. Um, also, you can point Beehive directly at a block device. Um, so to try to get better performance, uh, we actually have multi a thread per outstanding I.O. on Beehive. Um, so a device can issue up to eight I.O.s um, they, they go to individual threads, so they can complete out of order. Uh, it's sort of like a um, poor man's asynchronous I.O., but uh, it works across every type of block device where previously AIO, at least at one point in time, um, wasn't supported on all file systems or all types of uh, block devices. Uh, Beehive, Beehive also supports um, a graphics console. The initial version didn't. We only had a serial console, but uh, for certain um, desktop guests, that's basically impossible to use. Um, so the way that we worked around that is by putting in a, a frame buffer. So there's no acceleration on this at all. It's just a block of memory um, that is uh, 32 bits per pixel. Um, we put in support for this into our custom build of UEFI. And the nice thing about that is that all guest operating systems can see the graphics console from EFI and then we'll support it in dumb mode. So we didn't have to supply drivers for all guest operating systems. Um, so that was the graphical output for keyboard and mouse emulation. Um, we offer a PS2 um, keyboard and mouse. And we also have a USB tablet. Um, now, because FreeBSD doesn't have XORG in the base system, um, we can't link Beehive against um, graphics libraries uh, you know, to output to the screen. So the way we got around that problem is we implemented a small BNC server in Beehive. So basically, when you start up, the frame buffer um, is exported through BNC, and incoming events in from a VNC client are then injected into the PS2 or USB tablet um, emulation. Um, and this also brings up why we have a USB tablet. So our VNC only provides, um, or the PS2 um, mouse only provides relative coordinates, where VNC provides absolute. So what happens is if you move the mouse quickly, uh, most guest operating systems implement some form of mouse acceleration. And then the location, the absolute location diverges from the relative location. So you sort of end up chasing the pointer around the screen. But a USB tablet uses absolute coordinates. So you get a one-to-one -one lock between the mouse location in VNC and where it is on the guest screen. So that was more of a, a usability enhancement. Um, another type of I.O. that we support is directly assigning PCI devices to guests. Uh, and this is an exception to where we have to kind of implement in software um, a complete device. 
Uh, what happens with this is you have to tell FreeBSD that you don't want to use that adapter. So you can do that at boot time um, by assigning it directly to Beehive, or you can do it at runtime uh, just by removing it from the current driver and then assigning it to Beehive. Um, the way it works is that uh, we map guest register space directly into a guest. Uh, so we can program device registers directly. But for traffic that comes from the adapter itself, which is uh, DMA, that has to be translated from guest physical memory into host physical memory. So the uh, IOMMU is used to do that, and it sort of uses the exact exact contents of paging structures as the EPT paging structures, because it does the same thing. Um, now, to do this, we have to make sure that all guest memory is always present because we can't get page faults uh, from DMA devices. Um, and that it is a kind of an issue in that if you have a large amount of memory for a guest, there may not be enough memory on the system to allocate it. But um, that's just the price you have to pay for PCI pass through. Um, the reason that you would want to do this is because you may want to um, get the most most performance you possibly can, such as using um, 40 gig Ethernet or 100 gig Ethernet. Uh, implementing that in software um, really isn't going to get anywhere near that performance, uh, just because of the amount of software stack that we have to traverse. Um, another reason to use PCI pass-through is if you have an adapter that isn't supported by FreeBSD, it might be supported by Linux. So you could run up a Linux VM, assign that device to the Linux VM, and then set up some other form of communication so that you could still use that uh, from FreeBSD. So people have done this quite a lot for wireless adapters. Uh, there's a number of other um, types of emulation, maybe not so important. So for example, um, we offer um, sound. So there's a emulation of an Intel HDA audio and on the host, you basically just use the existing audio stack um, for output and to get mic input. Um, we do offer serial port emulation, which is kind of very useful if you just want to use a serial console for a guest. And we just have a classic PC 16550A devices there. And you point them at a TTY device, whether it's a PTY, um, an NMD, NMDM device, uh, a TTY or even just um, standard IO from the process itself. And last one here is just um, a random device. So we do offer um, a Vertio random PCI adapter that just goes and points to dev random um, on the host system. Uh, one other part of the hypervisor is um, firmware. So every PC system comes with a BIOS so, or EFI, so you always have something to boot from. So we kind of have to provide uh, something similar for a virtual machine. So we have two ways that uh, we can actually boot a guest. So one is with um, firmware, which runs in the context of the guest. So for Beehive, there's a custom UEFI, UEFI firmware image and that's derived from open source EDK2, but it has a bunch of drivers that are specific to Beehive. Maybe the best one, best known one is the um, frame buffer driver, uh, so that you can actually boot um, a virtual machine and you can see um, EFI in the initial splash screen of the guest. Uh, to support older operating systems that want to see BIOS and don't support EFI, uh, we have a build of UEFI that actually has a 16-bit um, module called, its terminology is known as CSM, which allows a guest to think there's a BIOS, but the 16-bit code actually trampolines back into EFI for IO. Um, so there is another way to boot a guest, and that's just to skip um, any kind of firmware. Um, this is more like uh, if you had a JTAG port plugged into a system and you just pushed in an image and then started the machine. Um, and that's the initial way that we actually used to boot Beehive. So in the base system, we have a program called Beehive Load, which can get a FreeBSD kernel and directly inject it. Um, and we have a similar method to do that 
for Linux or OpenBSD or NetBSD, and that's to use Grub Beehive uh, from the ports collection. Uh, this doesn't actually work with the um, graphics. Uh, it's only for serial console operating systems. Um, I had a question here about um, Beehive crashing when PCI pass-through and VNC are simultaneously enabled. Um, I've not heard of that. Um, I'd like to get some more information um, for whoever raised that. So here's an example of uh, starting a virtual machine using the Beehive um, command line. Um, it's fairly complicated. So this is, I'm going to do an install of a Windows 10 guest. I have a CD image um, for Windows. I'm going to give it two virtual CPUs and four gigabytes of RAM. So just going through these, uh, that's the number of CPUs that we're going to assign to the virtual machine. This is the start of the PCI hierarchy. So we're putting a host bridge at um, slot zero, and that's pretty much what happens on most systems. Uh, we're going to add an AHCI CD-ROM device, and the backing file we're using for that is the actual uh, Windows install ISO image. Um, on slot four on the PCI bus, we're going to add an Intel E1000 device, and it's going to be pointed at the TAP device uh, for networking. On slot 11, we've added the frame buffer device. And the parameter to the frame buffer device here is it's going to be a VNC server. Um, it's going to accept connections from any address on the standard VNC port of 5900. And we're actually not going to start the virtual machine until the user has connected uh, with a VNC client. Um, and PCI slot 20, we're going to add an XHCI controller for USB 3 and we're going to insert a tablet device. And the tablet assumes that it's going to get input from the BNC server. Uh, for disk for this virtual machine, uh, we're going to add an NVMe controller. And the disk image for the NVMe controller is just going to be um, a file that uh, you could use creating truncate. Um, this device is um, a PCI to ISA. Um, bridge. Um, it's uh, a little strange. It's actually required by um, EFI, and Windows also wants to see um, an LPC device. So it's kind of just a template that has to be added there. Uh, for the boot ROM for this machine, we're going to be using EFI, and we're going to be using the EFI build from uh, the FreeBSD ports collection. And the last parameters here, this is where the four gigabytes of RAM comes from. Uh, when the virtual machine executes a halt instruction, we're going to sleep rather than just spin. And this last option is just um, ignore unimplemented MSR accesses from the guest. And that's basically just to stop. Um, uh, whenever you run on a new machine, there's always additional MSRs that are added. A lot of guests will try to access those. Sometimes we haven't actually caught up in implementing them, and they're usually safe to ignore. So that's a fairly good option to put in. Now, uh, that's all a bit complicated to have to do every time or even have to understand. So a number of tools have kind of sprung up to make this a lot easier to do. Um, because generally, when you want to run up a virtual machine, you're not really interested in the kind of minute of PCI hierarchy or the actual types of devices. You just want networking, you want a disk, and you want to be able to connect to it. Um, so uh, there's a lot of front ends to Beehive. Um, a very popular one is VM Beehive. So just comparing the previous command that I issued, uh, this is quite a lot simpler. You can basically tell it that you want to create a Windows machine, uh, you want to do an install, and then you actually want to start it. So from a user perspective, that's quite a lot simpler than having to uh, deal with a command line every time. So since uh, Beehive is just a process on FreeBSD and it 
um, you know, tries to function as something that lives in a larger system, uh, you can monitor it using uh, existing FreeBSD utilities. So a classic thing is uh, to use PS just to see what processes are running, top to see what's using the most CPU, GSTAT to see what's happening from um, IO. If you want to monitor uh, networking, you can do TCP dump on a tap interface. And Beehive itself has a number of built-in D-trace trace points um, if you really want to see what's happening with VM exits or some finer detail there. Uh, the one that I generally use all the time is top with the minus H option, which shows threads within a process. So in Beehive, we actually name the threads just to try to make it a little more descriptive. Um, so I have an example here. I was running a 4 vCPU Ubuntu guest, and I was running it in graphics mode. Um, I gave it 4 gig, which uh, you can kind of see there, but uh, it hadn't faulted in all the guest memory yet. So I was using currently at about 2.7 gig. What you see is over time that will kind of slowly move up to the configured guest memory as more and more memory is touched. Um, in terms of threads within this um, process, uh, the VNC server uh, is using um, about 3.5% of CPU uh, just to go and um, get the frame buffer and look at it and decide what's going to be sent out. Um, the guest was actually sitting there idle and it wasn't really doing anything. And Linux is quite good at uh, not doing work when it doesn't have to. So you can see the actual CPU threads from a full CPU guest uh, are using almost zero CPU. Uh, of course, as soon as you start running something, you know, you'll see them ramp up. Um, so basically, uh, this figure is idle, but there's no breakout in user system for a guest that's just added together. Um, so there's still quite a lot of active development happening with Beehive. Uh, I think some projects that are underway um, that'll be landing at some point in the future that are interesting are the ARM64 port. Um, that's moving away finally from x86 and being able to support ARM v8 as a hypervisor to be able to run ARM guests. Uh, there's code already in current for uh, file system access. So rather than if you just want to access files on the host rather than setting up an NFS, ex NFS export and having an NFS client in the guest, you can configure vertio 9 p and basically there's no networking involved. It will just go through and it can access files directly. Um, there's early code in Beehive for save and resume where you can checkpoint a VM and then some point in the future you can restart it. Uh, and also uh, to try to get better um, accelerated graphic support. Uh, there's some work in progress to pass um, GPU adapters directly through. It's kind of a little complicated with PCI pass-through. They're not, not straightforward hardware devices. There's often some strange side conditions, uh, but the work that's been done on that attempts to get around those limitations. Um, so just some resources from the FreeBSD project about Beehive. Um, there's a very good section in the FreeBSD handbook um, about how to start up guests and do various bits of configuration. Uh, there's information on the FreeBSD wiki. Um, there's an email list uh, where pretty much anything can be discussed about Beehive or even just FreeBSD virtualization in general. And uh, one thing we'd like to announce is um, with the success of all the other office hours from FreeBSD, we'd like to add a Beehive office hours, uh, which will be broadcast in a similar fashion. And that will allow people to uh, ask direct questions. And that's pretty much it. Um, thanks for the FreeBSD Foundation for uh, carving out the time to do this. Um, so if anybody has any questions, please ask via IRC. Uh, the last thing I was going to do was just, I have an Ubuntu um, VM running in graphics mode that I can bring up uh, and I can just walk around that a little bit.
All right, this is Ubuntu 20.10, um, very recently released. Um, I started up with um, four vCPUs and four gig of RAM. Uh, it's using XHGO tablet, so the mouse tracking, it's not um, super fast, but it uh, at least follows the cursor on VNC. So we have four CPUs here. So I'm just running Kotlin Linux, and there's not a whole lot going on. Uh, this is just a dumb frame buffer, so you can sometimes kind of see artifacts of redraw when a window is moved. It doesn't go as smoothly as on a system that has um, GPU acceleration, uh, but it still functions. We have a question. Yes. Here. <laughs> um, they want to know um, they can run it on a Raspberry Pi 4. Not yet. So Raspberry Pi 4 is an ARM V8 CPU. Currently, Beehive is uh, x86 only. Um, as I mentioned, there's some work to um, port uh, Beehive to ARM V8. Um, the Raspberry Pi 4 um, has, I think it's a, an okay virtualization platform. Um, it has the support that's required, so um, it will happen at some point in the future. Okay, um, one more. I wonder how to manage large Beehive deploys. Is there a mature framework to do that? Um, not that I know of. I mean, uh, there's definitely support for libvirt, um, which is a kind of a front end to just virtual machines in general. It's independent of the hypervisor, so it can sit in front of KVM or Zen, and there's some some level of support for Beehive. Uh, I believe there's a lot of tools that sit in front of libvirt, although I'm really not familiar with any of them, but that sounds like a path to investigate for that. There's another question. I actually pasted that one because it's a long one. I'm going to let you look at it. <laughs> um, yeah, the question is, uh, can you have multiple types of storage for virtual machines? Um, uh, well, if so, the second part of the question is, um, uh, could it support some type of um, sparse disk representation, such as QCOW2? Um, on the first part, uh, if multiple types you mean by multiple um, disk emulations, um, sure, that doesn't matter. You can have any combination of AHCI and VME that I block. There's no limitations with that. Um, in terms of sparse files, uh, um, Beehive has never really supported that. There's definitely there's a review out for QCOW2 support, but um, it's mainly an issue when you're importing um, an image from another location. Uh, and even then, there's tools that can convert it to and from flat. Um, uh, I guess that you could say it's a missing, missing part of Beehive. It would probably be nice if we had support for VMDK or um, QCOW2 or um, VHD, but um, uh, until that's available, um, generally you can just translate it um, into flat and uh, that will work today with Beehive. Okay, no more questions yet, but I'll let you know as they come in. <laughs> <I'm> still... <laughs> So, um, so if we get more questions too after the talk is over, you're always welcome to add them here, and um, you always tweet them to the foundation. Then we'll um, we'll reach out to Peter and get answers to those questions there, um, which would probably give us a broader audience too, which would be great. So, is that it? So. 
I think yeah, no more questions right now. So okay. <laughs> hmm. So um. Well, then I'd like to say thank you to Peter for giving us this um, introduction talk to Beehive. And I think it's really been an honor to get one of the original developers, co-founders, co-author. I know he refers to himself as co-author on Beehive, but to give this presentation to us in the community as well as other people who um, who are trying to learn more about FreeBSD. So, um, I want to send out a big thank you to Peter and um, um, and also, it, it, I mean, I think in the last year you've been um, stepping back in and contributing back to the project, right? Because I, I saw you back in um, Australia when we had the FreeBSD Summit there, or MiniConf, that was in January earlier this year. It's pretty hard to believe that <laughs> when we were still able to travel and <laughs> and I think at that point you were getting back involved with Beehive, right? Uh, yeah, I, I got my commit bit reactivated, so I'm back to doing uh, FreeBSD work. Yeah, so that's really, I mean, it's exciting for us. It's, it's exciting for the project to have you back. So thank you so much. Um, so, um, so that concludes the Beehive talk. And then in two weeks, um, at back at the regular time, I believe, uh, we'll have an introduction to Risk Five on FreeBSD, and that'll be given by Mitchell Horn. So we will see you here in two weeks. So thank you, everyone.